just stuck out in the middle of nowhere, trying to dig shell scrapes while we were lying with our hands, trying to just claw the ground because the rounds were only just passing over our heads. If I would have went like that, my hand would have come off. Sergeant uh, Martin Baird, who was to our left, he was in cover. And he said to the, to the CO of C Company, the anti-tanks over there, they've got no cover. They're pinned down them lads. We'll have to get them lads out of here. Um, and then the, the machine gun fire started taking effect, you know, hitting people. Um, Corporal Hope, he, he was with A Company and he took one through the head. Um, he's still alive, but it, it was a fatal wound, if you know what I mean. Um, Corporal Hope took one. Then I, I took one. It caught me from the left. Um, it went through my nose, hit my cheekbone, took my eye out and my cheekbone out. And somehow my jaw smashed together and my top teeth out at the same time. Immediately when I got it, I put my hand to my face and I thought, I've got a big hole in my face. Yes, three days in June. I think, Jimmy, to anyone that was on that mountain, they know immediately what you're what you're talking about, do they not? Yeah, it's it's I've read books before where they do all the all the story of when I joined the army, the the, the ship, the, the sailing down there and the march across. But what most fascinating, what I most thought people would want to know is the battle, the crux that are matter, you know, and what and the three days is all I wanted, you know, because that was what I thought was most vitally important. The three days, not the march across, not the sail down, you know, the three days in June. Well, I'll tell you what, mate, I reckon people on our podcast, that's exactly what they're going to want to listen to. And um, yeah. let's not be too candid about it because yeah. war is a freaking horrible, messy business and, and yep. people need to know about it because our youngsters get a very glamorised view of what killing is from all these mm. Xbox games and stuff. Mm. And... Um, we all need to be aware of what what what's on the table, don't we, really? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'll just lay out my table, Jimmy. Is I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated. I'm obviously, growing up in that era and then going on to join the Marines, I was fascinated mm. with the Falklands era. My best mate's mm. dad fought down there. Uh, God, I always get emotional when I say this, but my, my best mate had to sit in the bath as a, what we would have been, what ten years old, maybe maybe twelve. Yeah. He used to he, he used to watch the news to see the names that come up at the end of the news to see if his dad mm. had been killed in mm. battle that day. Uh, and then he used to take himself off to the bath and just have a bath on his and and just just so no one would see him crying. Mm. It's just insane, you know. I I remember when we when me dad was telling me how he got told I'd been injured, like, you know, and my dad was a, he's an ex-professional boxer and he's a, he's not a softy, like, you know, and he was in the house just sitting there on a Saturday afternoon and my sister was looking out the window 
and she said, there's an army man in the street. And, you know, you just put two and two together, you know. And then she said, he's coming down our path. And my dad said, I couldn't get out that chair. I couldn't move. And the fella knocked on the door and he said, I, I just couldn't get out the chair. And one of my sisters, I've got uh, four sisters and they're all screaming, everyone's screaming. And the officer just came straight in and said, he's not dead. He's not dead. He's it. And he's coming home. And that destroyed my dad, like, you know. I can't think of anything, uh, anything worse, mate. I've mm. seen some of the dads cry, literally crying in their beer when their, their, their kids have been killed in the Middle East in this last 20 years. And, uh, yeah, having to live with that when the smug likes of Tony Blair have made, yeah. made freaking bil billions yeah. for themselves off mm. all those deaths. Mm. It, it, I don't know how they live with themselves. Well, that's a whole other story again, isn't it? But let's let's stick with your yeah. Yeah. Don't do you an injustice, mate. Um, I fairly recently, so in, in the last year, maybe two years, I read. Uh, Vince Bramley's book, yeah, Excursion to Hell, yeah, and again that was a very gritty, no holds barred. Yeah, but it it depends if you know what actually happened. See, for for the for someone who is just reading it as a book, I like Vince. Vince is a nice lad. lad. I speak to Vince, but the book is totally inaccurate. Inaccurate. Okay, I'm still I still speak with Vince now. Yeah, I know what is wrong and I know what is right, and I I know that never happened, that never happened, that never happened in that or you know it, there's so many things that so, but people are fascinated by the book and they swear by the book, but it's only when you actually know, you know, mm. I know in my heart that someone can read my book, and that's right. Mm. You know, everything happened in that order. That's what happened, and that's where it happened, and that's how it happened. And, and I can live with that, like, you know. Yes. Where shall we start, Jimmy? If your book's the three days, do you want to... What made you join the Paris? To be honest, when I was a young... When my first job leaving school I worked in a margarine factory and as you can imagine they're not the best jobs in the world you know I, my job we used to be standing at the end of a conveyor belt the margarine come down the boxes of margarine come down the conveyor belt and I'd stack it on pallets and you're done that day after <laughs> after day and I had a, a cousin who was in four para and he, he loved it and I thought, well, if he likes it, I'll have a go with that. And I joined Four Para, which is, it's about 500 metres from where I am now. Um, it, that's how near it was to me, you know. So I joined that and all the physical, I loved it. It was like, it was just, it, it opened my eyes to it, you know. And I thought, I, I love this. Hmm. I'm going to go regular. And I went regular, and I've never, never looked back. Best, best thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. Jim, can I just say your screen, your screen is vibrating. I oh yeah, I've got my hands on the table. I'll take yeah. my hands off the table. I'll, I'll be telling you off for that because uh -huh. <laughs> it can really ruin what. Yeah, what, no, no, sorry what, about that. What essentially is going to be a brilliant yeah. podcast. I yeah. know it. Yeah. Um, and when you say four para, um, is this the the TA? The TA uh, para, yeah, yeah. How were they looked at from the regulars? Are they kind of held um, in, in as equal? Truthfully, uh, they're a cracking bunch of lads. Um, they do, they're, they're professional. The four para, I could not fault them. Um, I'm still friends with them lads today. I go the local PR parachute regiment association. All them lads are there. The lad, the, he was a sergeant at the time when I joined the TA. I'm still great friends with it. I honestly, I've got the highest respect for them. Yeah, it's funny that because when I speak to um, 
Royal Marine reservists mm. who see some of them seem way more combat than I ever saw, right? Mm. And they, they say, Chris, I was only in the RMR, and I'm like, what are you on about? If you've yeah. got a green lid, you've got a green lid. Yeah, yeah. And when I served in Belfast, I didn't even know the guys until after the tour. Turned out that the guys I'd been on patrol with every day, two of them were would come mm -hmm. up through the RMR, and it just yeah. you don't. There's absolutely no difference in their their soldiering. The only thing I got told was, when you go in regular, going through depot, don't mention your X four para because they'll expect more of you. Do you know what I mean? You know, the weapon training, weapon handling and all that. So just keep your mouth shut and just go along with it, like, you know. And it worked. You would have joined up... Jimmy, 79. Yeah, 79. That, that was round about the time the Paris documentary was on the telly, wasn't it? No, that was just after. When I joined... Um, I joined in the June 79, and in August, while I was going through depot, Warren Point happened. You remember what you remember Warren Point? Yeah, can you explain that for our listeners? Uh, Warren Point was um, it was a bomb, uh, a, 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 it was an ambush in Northern Ireland, and 18 members of two para were killed um, in a in a bomb in a place called Narrow Water. And I remember being at depot when all the funerals were going on. There was lads coming from everywhere to, to carry the coffins and what have you. And it was, it sort of brought your home, brought it home to you what you were joining, you know, watching these coffins with Union Jacks on and what have you, as you got, you know, you, and, but saying that, it was something I always wanted to do. I, I, I've, when I was a child, I always was fascinated by the army because I was a child of the 60s and it's only 15 years after the Second World War. There was loads of World War II veterans in my life, like, you know, who were young men at that time, like, you know. And, like, to be honest, we had a shop by our house selling all World War, you know, well, all World War II stuff that had just been brought back, you know? If, if I had my time machine, I'd be going back, buying all the stuff. Yes, and I, was, I just wanted, on the subject of Warren Point, what, that was a secondary device as well. There was a secondary... Yeah, the first one went off. off. Uh, one was, be, and the lads took cover behind a wall, and then another, they, 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 they picked a likely gathering point Everyone hid behind the wall. Another one went off, like you know. Yeah, for our friends at home, this was a a, um, a tactic of the IRA. Is they would set off one device. It might not necessarily even be very big, mm. but then knowing that the the security force would, would gather and set up likely set up, points, yeah, set up a command post, Jimmy, wasn't it? Mm. And they would predict where the command post would be and put a bigger mm. a bigger bomb. Or a bigger device under there, and this at Warren Point, it was um, just tragic. Yeah. I met someone. I, I think I met one of the guys in that troop. Uh, I met him years later, and he said, "Chris, I went from a uh, like a four man room to a one man room overnight." Yeah, it was, it was absolutely awful. Because to be honest, the battalion I was in. Uh, when I left depot, when I passed out, I was sent to three para in Germany and the lads in three para had to reinforce two para. Um, so they sent a load of three para to, you know, to fill the spaces like, you know. Did they have, um, or did you meet bootnecks and, and Gurkhas on your para course, on the jumps course? No, uh, the only ones that joined our uh, Bryce Norton, the parachute course, was some SAS boats who were getting the wings. Uh, that was the only ones on ours. But I can imagine they're, they're fairly well mixed, like, you know, because everyone's getting their wings and what have you. Yeah, them SAS guys, they, they're good guys, I found. Mm, mm. 
very very professional and very un, unassuming. You wouldn't really know. The things that I I found a bit strange is a lot of the people who I thought would pass easily failed, <laughs> and lads who went. And you think there's no way he's getting in. They got in, hmm. and, and you think, how is that? Like I don't know whether you know it, but um, Corporal McLaughlin put in uh, Stuart McLaughlin. Hmm. Um, he he failed his selection on a, on an injury. But you'd think if anyone would get through, it'd be Stuart McLaughlin. Like you know, he is he is the man. Like you know, but he he had an injury and. Um, he kept him on um, doing stuff. I think he was playing enemy, you know, just while his, his leg healed and what have you. But the injury was that great. They had to send him back to battalion mm. in the end. like. And I think he, he he resented going back, but made the best of it, like, you know. Yeah, we're going to talk more about him later, aren't we? Because mm. um... I used to travel home at the weekend with him. With us both being from Liverpool, we used to share a car. A car used to get all the scousers together. Everyone used to put in like a tenner or something like that, and uh, we'd all come home together in a car. Mm. What was your balloon jump like? Um, it was a bit unnerving because two people in front of me refused. Um, first, he called you. Uh, number two, come forward, and he just said no. And he said, number three, come forward. And he said, he said, no. And I thought, this isn't good. And he said uh, to me, number four, come forward. So I went forward, out the balloon. Um, and you find that when you go back to camp, them lads who've refused, they're gone. Mm. The lock locker's empty, beds stripped. You never see them blokes again. And uh, like, to be honest, we did have, on uh, when it was a prize, we had two lads very, very badly injured. Um, I watched them pile in. Um, they got tangled up, she dropped like a stone. One hit the floor, and one landed on top of the the other bloke. The fella on the bottom got smashed to pieces, and he was he went in hospital, never, never, never to be seen again. The other lad, he was badly injured never to be seen again. But we'd all watched it happen. And he said, right, get back in that plane. He took us back to the, to Bryce Norton and made us jump again, you know, to just get the confidence back. Because the longer you leave it after seeing something like that, you might start thinking about it, you know. So the plan was get them back in the aircraft and get them all out again. like, And it works, like, you know. Yes. Funny what you do when you're young, isn't it? I, I, young I mean, and daft. Yeah, uh, that balloon jump. I mean, you, you've got a reserve on, but you haven't got time. They, hey, you, no, no, no. You drop 200 before they open, before the parachute inflates. Mm. I think By the I time said you realise it hasn't, there's nothing down for you. I think I said this on my podcast before. I was I was in the cage, the balloon cage or the yeah. bas basket. There was three, three young paras who would obviously just done their P company mm. and I was a train rank. I'd been in for about four years. So when they said right number off, I'm like one, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> just, um, and, I, and he said, okay, number one to the door. I turned around. I went, I'll see you guys on the ground. Mm. And when we had the debrief, the, the jump instructor went through, where's fucking through. Dear Corporal, he said, what do you mean? Fucking Geronimo. <laughs> but uh, they don't... Do, like, go ahead. Well, they don't do it anymore, do they? The balloon jump's gone. They My last jump before I left the army was a balloon. Because um, to be honest, after you've got out of basic training, it's a bit of a jolly. It's, a, it's one of them just for a laugh sort of thing. And I'd been downtown shopping with a couple of lads and we were walking back to camp and we could see on the football field at the back of the depot, the balloon was up. So we said, Teddy, what, should we see if we can get a jump 
this morning, you know, because we're going on the ale this afternoon, like, you know. So we went down, we said, any chance of a jump? Uh, and the PGI just said, yeah, just pick one up, strap up, and in you go, like, you know. It, it's funny, it's, it's like fun once you're in regular, like, you know. Mm. I told this story on a podcast and some PJI started giving it a big one, but they, they used to take the balloon around a country. Yeah, yeah. And they took it up to 4-5 Commando up at Arbroath. Mm. And the train lads were just taking off their woolly pulleys with their wings on and giving them to their mates, going, go on, you aren't mm. going up. Mm. And, and, and let people spin dits and they exaggerate. That's yeah, part yeah. of being in the military, right? Mm. But... Mm. My mate wouldn't have just lied to me. Mm. <laughs> um, and he said that some of the guys were you know, throwing themselves out of this basket and the PJ was going, are you sure he's he's trained? <laughs> it, uh, say, I think them days are gone right like now, you know, with the health and safety and everything like that. But mm. as you say, the way, the way things gone on, that, that you'd never get away with now, like, you know. No, no. I did. Sorry, folks at home. I, I am talking a lot, but these are just great conversations to have that there was. Um, Jimmy, I, my mate does a podcast and he had a guest on. Mm. And my mate's doing a podcast and he's not military, so he's taking this yeah. guy dead serious. And the guy's clearly like, a, 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 let's say, let, let's say he's got a bit of an imposter syndrome. Mm. And he says to my mate, yeah, when we were in the, uh, it's some like, uh, not Navy SEALs, but some Rangers or some American thing, right? He said, um, we're all in the plane. We got our shoots and we all just took our shoots off, man. And we threw them out the door. And then we jumped after them and put them on in the air. <laughs> the the, um, the best, one, best one I heard. I was on a train coming back to older shot or something. And uh, this fella said, uh, Paras. And I said, yeah, mate, yeah. He said, I've met your lot. I said, oh, have you? He said, I went out drinking with them one night. And they got me so drunk. They took me back to camp, took the airplane up and threw me out the door with a parachute. He didn't you? You know, words fail, like, you know, mm. they took me back to camp and took the plane up, you know, as they do, like, you know. There was a funny thing, though, with the SBS years ago, before health and safety, if mm. you were civilian, yeah, they, they would take you up and let you do a water jump without any training. Not, yeah. not, not now, of course, because, I mean... Yeah. You could quite easily drown. Well, not easily, but but you, you, the <laughs> yeah. possibility is you could yeah. have you got covered in your chute and you couldn't yeah, breathe. Yeah. You could easily drown. But yeah, can't remember someone was on the podcast. But it's uh, all your drills. It's all your, your your safety drills. What you know, things that actions on sort of thing. Yeah, if you got twists or your yeah. a malformed or your, canopy or something. Or you you know using your reserve. Yeah. You know, what do think, you do if you don't I know? I think they probably took them over the basics, but um, how things have changed. Yeah. How did you get down south then? Um, on the Canberra. Well, it wasn't too bad, to be honest. Um, we sailed down. And what was good, um, I was in the anti-tanks platoon. And uh, they let us mix with 4-5 Commando, um, their anti-tank platoon. And we were like, we went as guests to have a good night out with them, you know, just to get our know, know our opposite numbers sort of thing, like, you know. And I found the Marines all good lads, like, you know. In fact, not long after we come back to England, we were invited down to, um, is it South Sea? Down there. Uh, they had a big do. And the, the Marine, Yeah, down Portsmouth somewhere. Mm -hmm. It might have been South Sea or something. But... And we thought, we're going to have murder here, you know, because the, the, all the Marines down there. And uh, But they were great. They were really, really made welcome, like, you know. Yeah. The uh, Royal Marines U U Museum used to be at South Sea, I think it might be. Yeah, uh, we had a ball that. down there, because you were expecting 
you just know you just you just expect the worst, don't you? You know. Mm. It's there by the grace of God, though, isn't it? Because I yeah, come from, yeah. I come from the south, and it's heavily navy down here. So mm. naturally, you see Marines buzzing around, and my mate's yeah. dad was a Marine because that's why he was my neighbour because he's yeah. based at four two. And um, so I joined them. Marie, I actually joined because my mate bet me I couldn't do it, and I went, "You're so bloody can." And and mm. but had I been had I grew up in older shot, it, it or some, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 I would have joined something. I wouldn't might join the army, you know. Um, Vince Bramley grew up in older shot. He ended up in the Paris. Pete mm. Edeker, who got killed on Longdon, grew up in older shot. Joined the Paris, like you know. Mm. And um, they called it the White Whale, Canberra, didn't they? Yeah, the white whale, yeah, yeah. How that it, thing didn't get hit? I know, I know. Um, I, I remember, to be honest, on the Falklands, we just the day we landed, we, our job was to, as soon as we get off, head to the left, there's a place called, the high ground is called Windy Gap, and we were to climb up to the top of Windy Gap and just uh, dominate the high ground, you know? Um, a company would sweep through Port San Carlos, clear the settlement, and say we'd clear the high, secure the high ground, and um, that's what we done. But as I, when we when we secured the top, I turned round to look because air attacks air attacks had begun, and the 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 camera was there. This, as you say, the great white whale, and you know you think, what is that? doing there if if there's a target that is the target you know because mm -hmm. it stood out like a sore thumb and how both heavy, did go ahead how heavy was your bergen well it must have we, waited. what we, we everyone says the bergen we didn't have bergens four or five commando carried bergens um we didn't carry we didn't it sounds i don't know we didn't see the point in, in bergens um, we loaded up in fighting order, which is, you know, you know what fighting order is. Mm -hmm. It's just your weapon with as much ammo as you can carry. We're going for a fight. We're not going to sleep overnight. We don't, you don't want your spare demons, your spare boots, your spare. We're going on like an advance to contact sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, it, it was heavy because I remember climbing up that hill to to the um, to Windy Gap. I had four eight four. We land when we landed. Every man carried uh, four mortar bombs, two in each hand. Two in each hand. Your, your rifle was on a sling. I had four eighty four rounds on me back, plus me link everything. Wait, honest to God, you weighed a ton. So getting up to the top of Windy Windy Gap as fast as you can with all that lot is, is a bit of doing. And I say the air attack, they, they've shot over, over Windy Gap and dropped down into like what they call Bomb Alley. Um, and I say, we made it up to the top and then I turned around and had a proper look and I seen the camera and I thought, that's going to get it. And bombs did land around it, but never hit it. And there's civvies as well. I know, you know. They did have some, I believe the Marine Band was on there, and I imagine, I'm, I'm sure they were, they'd be manning GPMGs or something like, you know, but um, it had like a local defence on it, but that's not from a, you know, a, a, one of them Skyhawks comes dropping bombs around you, you know? Yeah, because it didn't it become a bit of a hospital ship? Yeah, it was a hospital ship, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we had... Um... Brian on the podcast. Brian was one of the bandsmen who was yeah. on there, and um, he witnessed some. Or I think he, they witnessed one of his friends got got shot dead in the water by the Argentines. He was a yeah, pilot. Yeah. It was just nasty. Mm. And how how old were you at this point? Um, I was twenty two, which is it's like an oldest. To be honest, when you're dealing with like eighteen. 19 and 17 year olds 22 is a bit older you know so i was like a little bit of an older soldier because you know when you're young age is so much different mm. i remember there was a, there was a bloke who was with me 
and he was 27. And I used to think, he's so old, <laughs> you know, so old at 27. I used to, I used to think you old B, you know, because... I used to well, think you old C. <laughs> <laughs> we had St Steve, I, mean, I was... Steve was in my troop. He was 28, mm. right? And I was 22. I mm. thought, I'm never going to be that old. Well, I had, a, I had a good friend. He was wounded on Longdon, a fella called Bill Metcalf. Now, he'd, um, he, he tried to join the British Army, but he was unfit, and he, he, he wouldn't let him join. And at the time, in like the 70s, like 1975, there was adverts in the paper to fight in Rhodesia. So he joined the Rhodesia, because he couldn't get in the British Army, he joined the Rhodesian Army, and he was in the Rhodesian Light Infantry, in the Bush Wars and all that sort of thing. And then after leaving that, he come back to England and joined the Parachute Regiment. And by that time, he was like 28. And we used to call him Grandad, you know, because <laughs> 28 was old, like, you know. Yes. Sorry, Jim, just making some notes. No, no, you do your mate, stuff. Um, some of the stuff we're talking about will make a good good clips. And how were you feeling? What was... A, 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 because I, I think almost everybody I've spoken to who served in the Falklands says, says that. It's probably a bit cliche, but they just didn't think it was going to happen. We wanted it to happen, but we didn't think it would happen. We thought we'd get there, the boat would turn round and and come back home, but we wanted it. We it, It's something you want. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're young and daft, you're worry and you want to go down. It's it's sort of the, the height of your career sort of thing to go and actually do it, you know? Because I remember when I joined Three Parrot, Three in Germany, they'd just come back uh, from Northern Ireland. And if you hadn't been to Northern Ireland, you hadn't been anywhere, like, you know, you felt, you know, because they'd all been to, uh, I think they were in the Ardoyne, and if you hadn't been the Ardoyne, you were a crow, like, you know, and you you wanted to go and do something. And say, before the Falklands, I did go to Northern Ireland, so it sort of breaks your duck a bit, like, you know. Mm. Yes. Thinking of Jock, Jock was on patrol. Jock was our tail end Charlie, literally five meters behind me, and he he got shot three times in the Ardoin. <laughs> so, yeah, just and 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 he, and he got up to fight another day. Mm. Um, was it was it a factor? Was it disappointing at all that you were being inserted by boat as opposed to coming from the sky? Or um. Uh, now with the distance, you knew it wasn't it wasn't going to happen, like you know. Um, but saying that, we sailed down on the Canberra with all our, our parachute kit. Everything was loaded on the, for every event eventuality. Um, so all our we took south all our parachuting kit. We were ready to go any any way we could, sort of thing. But as as it got as we got nearer, you knew it wasn't happening, like you know. Mm. It would have been good, though. Oh, it would have been legendary, wouldn't it? Oh, you know, riding a Valkyrie is going in, you know. <laughs> I think they tried to get one set up in in Afghanistan. and, and... Yeah, I think a company did drop, Pathfinder Company. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And it, it paras don't get scared, but was it? Everyone gets scared, mate. There we go. There we go. So how were you feeling at this stage? Was it was it all very real or were, were you thinking, oh, it's um, still, still not going to happen? No, we, we, we knew we were going to do it. It's what you train for and it's what you're there for. And you've got, you know, your mates are good mates and, you know, we can do our job and we'll do it. Like, But the only thing was, and I know it, it was an unopposed landing, but when you're bouncing about in that landing craft, Eden for sure, it's nothing is certain. And as it was, where we landed, there was an Argentine platoon in Port, Port San Carlos. And that, that same platoon did shoot down two helicopters and kill three of the, the crew. 
the crew. So when the three para landed on that beach, if they would have stayed and set a couple of jimpies up, can you imagine? Mm. You open the door of that landing craft and you fire a burst of GPMG down it. You know, that could have happened. It's the not knowing what's going to happen. There was so much of that there by the grace of God, wasn't there? It's things mm. that if they'd been slightly different, it just yeah, could yeah. have been a catastrophe. Mm. Well, we a company secured the settlement, but the, the Argentine plat platoon had bugged out. And a company said the settlement's secure, which it was. But the Argentines had fell back out away from the settlement and two, I think they were both gazelles, overflew the settlement and flew straight into them. And they just raped the two helicopters. The two helicopters that went down. Um, two died in the helicopter in the first helicopter. Second helicopter got shot down. Um, and the surviving, uh, I don't know whether he was a pilot or a crew member, dragged his mate out. He fired at them in the wa water. Mm. Um, he managed to get him to the to the side, and he, he, the lad died later, like, you know. Yes, this is what I was chatting to Brian about. Um, I think I've even put a clip on my channel about that, that was essentially an execution. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Good yeah. enough. Um, a company, a uh, patrol from A Company was sent out. A uh, couple stage went out to... Um, to rescue them sort of thing. And he put his GPMGs on the, on the high ground and sent a patrol forward and called some mortars in on the RGs. Like, and he got to them and um, one fellow was still alive. This fellow was still alive. And he started treating him and he couldn't understand what he was saying. He was, he was incoherent. He was just saying, thank you, thank you. Um, but he died. He, he sort of, I think he thought... He, He'd been rescued and give up. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm saved. I can stop fighting now. But in doing that, that was the end of him, like, you know. Sad. Was it, what was it like having to tab with all this massive weight? Um, well, we, you know yourself, you're used to tabbing with weight. That's what we do. It's what you do. Um, we are we, we often we, it's it's a weekly occurrence, you know. We're used to Waterburn, uh, Senny Bridge, all of the Breckens. It, it's it's our job. That's that's what we specialize moving fast with a lot of kit because that's what the airborne soldier does. You know, you drop out the sky, you fend for yourself, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it but I'll say it was a hard tab that was. It, it was hard. We went from San Carlos straight to Teal Inlet. We got in Teal Inlet about two o'clock in the morning and we left Teal Inlet at about, it gets daylight, about 10 o'clock in the morning. So we left about 11 o'clock. Four or five were just coming in as we were leaving. They were, they were walking in Teal Inlet as we were walking out Teal Inlet. We were off then to Estancia and... Um, that was the hardest tab because, as you know, not, 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 there's no roads, Everton's across country, stone runs, rivers, everything. And, you know, you, although as the crow flies, it's 60 mile to, you know, to, to Estancia, it's, it's, more, it's well more than 60 mile because you go and, you know, it's a good old snake all the way there, like, you know. I was at when when we reached Estancia, I was absolutely on my chin strap. I was I was exhausted. Lucky enough, my feet weathered all right. My feet were good. Um, because when we got to a, a Estancia, it was right, go up that mountain there, go up uh, Mount Venet. So we got it was 60 miles to Estancia. Now climb that mountain up there and sit on the top while everyone else catches up, like, you know. So we went up on Mount Estancia and we stayed there we, from 
the thing, it was a week and a half we stayed on the top of that mountain and it was freezing absolutely bitter because you just had ponchos right no gore yeah, well, to in be your honest face. i never got a sleeping bag <laughs> i always mention this people hate me saying it i had no sleeping bag um when we landed we didn't take a sleeping bag ashore with us it was just ammo and everton and we were told the sleeping bags would follow us up and then a, a chopper was bringing the sleeping underslung load on a chopper and an air raid happened while he was choppering them in and he ditched them into the sea and took cover in the in the land like you know so our sleeping bags went to the bottom of the ocean and we just used to cuddle up to it me and me mate Geordie Geordie Nicholson and we used to just you know, snuggle up like you know and then you didn't sleep on the on the march which was good in a way because you were you were hot from marching and what have you but once we got on the top of Mount Estancia we still had no sleeping bag and I was up there for about two days and then they must have said get them lads sleeping bags it's freezing up there and a chopper come and he dumped a load of sleeping bags and I must have been the last one to get told that the sleeping bags had arrived and when I went over there was this bust one with a burst zip and I had to get a, a piece of paracord and like lace myself into this sleeping bag, like, but it, you know, it, it done as it was, it kept me a little bit warmer, not warm, just a little bit warmer. I just said, when you talk about the zip, I had a flashback then when we were doing our final exercise in training, we were, we were sleeping on top of a tour on Dartmoor. Yeah. And in our harbour position. And whoever our alleged enemy or our play play enemy were, they they were come they were coming up the hill and everybody stood too. And I went to undo my sleeping bag, which I'd done up, you know, to about here, and the zip had stuck. <laughs> and oh. I could not for the life of me open this sleeping bag. Yeah. And all I could hear was this uh, this troop attack, you know, coming up, coming up the hill, all these schmoolies going up in the air, blank rounds being fired, thunder flashes being thrown, and I'm just <laughs> the, the whole of the attack. I just <laughs> I had to stay in the sleeping bag. It was yes, silly, silly. It's funny how something silly like that could have just, just to be honest, it was that cold. You it was just you, you couldn't sleep, it was that cold, and you'd get up. And in the night, and everyone would just be jumping up and down, like slapping themselves, going, it's so cold. <laughs> it's so cold. It was. I have never had, well, saying that during the battle, it was minus 15, like, you know, but it was cold down there, like, you know. That's testament, though, isn't it, to British Yeah, honestly, God. It's, it's us. It's, see... Four or five were in everyone's in the same everyone's in the same boat, you know. We're all in the same. Mm. We're all just as cold <laughs> and we've all walked just as far, you know. So let's talk about this attack then. Yeah, go ahead. When, when did your orders come through that you were going to take Longdon? We got ours on um, the 10th. Um, well, I say we got ours on the 11th, but the patrol commanders and they got theirs on the 10th and they were coming back, you know, to brief us and what have you. Um, so they got theirs. Oh, oh, it's like that. All the officers got their briefing. Then the um, platoon sergeant, section commanders all got that. And then we got ours, like, you know, um, and then it, it's in what it hits you. What's going to happen now? Who's going to be here tomorrow? Like, you know, because yeah. some of yours aren't. Yeah, it's all just got real. real, wasn't it? Yeah. And what was what's the sequence of events then? Is was, was ammunition being dished out, or you had that already? Yeah, we, the ammunition we carried is the ammunition you were going in with, like you know. Um, what we done? We are, I was with C Company. We were on Mount Vernon. There, you've got. 
A company who were there, B company, we're all in different locations. And the plan was we'll all meet up. All the companies would rendezvous at A company's location. So we're, we were like furthest away on the top of this mountain. So we got told to move, I think it was about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So we've got to come down this mountain, make our way up to A company's position. I think we got there about seven, because it's distance in the Falklands. It mightn't be far, but it takes a really long time to get, because the ground is absolutely, it's like a wet sponge. It's, it's just bogs and it's, so even though things aren't far away, they take a long time getting there. So anyway, we left about, about 12 o'clock, went down, Anyway, we, we converged on um, A Company's location about sec, seven o'clock. And the, the plan was A Company's go, gonna go first. They're gonna secure the start line, followed by B Company, followed by support, support company. C Company will bring up the rear. And um, we, will, we will move to wing forward with A Company and uh, B Company will move they will head south to the right and they'll go to the western end of Mount Longdon and support company will be located just behind them. And But it, like everything, once it all starts, I mean the move out, it all goes to, all goes to pot because we had to cross a, a river in the night on an aluminium ladder. That entire battalion with all the ammunition loads, the Milan teams, everyone over one ladder over a stream in the dark. Now, can you imagine your unit in the dark crossing over one ladder? It, you couldn't make it up, but that's what happened. So what it was, the fellas fell off the ladder, <laughs> fell in the stream, had to be rescued from the stream. People were going over it, gingerly over it. Some fellas were flying over it. But time is of the essence, and we were losing time. You know, it was getting slower and slower. So eventually, my, my company, C Company, well, wait, the time element we'd lost. So A co Company got over great. Well, the, they got, got over in their time and raced to the start line. But B Company, had all the delays of A company mm -hmm. and support company had all the delays of A company and B company. And then C company had all the delays from A, B and support company. So the, the, the timings went all to pot. So by the time C company got over my company, we were well behind in time. So we're moving as fast as possible. It was a dog leg. Once we crossed the, the stream, we bared left and bared left and then went right. It was like a dog leg to a, a, a position. And uh, so we made our position. Everyone had gone because we're running late. By the time we hit that position where we should have met everyone, B Company had, had arrived late on their position. A Company were in their position because they went they went first, you know, so they're in their position. B company arrived late and advanced immediately because they were running late. They were half an hour late. So they began moving. They moved across and then Corporal Brian Milne stood on the mine as four platoon were just edging round the northwest corner. When he was moving right, when they were moving round that corner, C company were just crossing that that crossing point. Now that that point had been registered as a an Argentine registered target because patrol platoon had been wrecking in the mountain and and they they'd initiated fire to be drawn on them and they were registering all the all the registered targets points that would be fired on and where we were crossing was a registered target. So when Brian stood on the mine, fire come from everywhere onto their registered targets. And we just emerged and machine gun fire, although it wasn't, they didn't, they weren't firing it. They didn't know we were there, 
but it was a registered target, so they just laid it on to that. And it was just passing over the top of us. We're all lying down there, the entire company. And I say that the battle just, that was the beginning. B Company is attacking now west to east. They're at the western end of the mountain, and they're going to fight. Because the Argentines were expecting to be attacked from the north, where, where I was going to the, I was going to the north. Um, they were expecting to be attacked. So all their GPS, all their guns, heavy machine gun, 50 cals, were all pointing north. That's because that's where they, that, that's where their threat was. Mm. Because they thought there was a, um, there was an inlet further to the north. And they thought the British will sail to this inlet and come at us from the north. And that was why we come from the west, you know, because roll them up from the side, like, you know. Uh, so they're firing to the north. Uh, once B Company, once Copper Mill stands on the mine, they open up at, at, every, at all their registered targets they're firing on. And then they discover B Company's battling up this side here. Six Platoon were halfway up the western slope when Brian stood on the mine. Um, and they just rushed in to the Argentine one platoon's area. And they were in the midst of one pl Argentine one platoon, and they were they were open fire on in 360 degree. They were in the middle of an enemy position. That's why some of the lads were shot from behind, and it was just it, they were in the imagine being in the middle of a platoon position. So next thing, everyone's firing at them, but they went firm and 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 attacked positions. But they went firm on fly off. And to be honest, them six platoon taking the high ground is, you know yourself, the winner takes the high ground. They dominated that, that high ground and they weren't getting off it. So they stayed up there. Four platoon who were in, in the minefield here, yeah, they made their way back in. They were supposed to be pushing directly east, but it was impossible because all the weapons were firing north. They would, have, they would have been wiped out if they would have carried on. So they they <laughs> turned inward towards the uh, towards the northwest corner of Mount Longdon. In this time, we'd made our way round to a place called Wing Forward with A Company. And A Company were pinned down. We were pinned down. And you could you could we could see from our position all the fighting that B Company, grenades, a, a multitude of explosions every it's like a, it, it was like the 12th of july there was just it was it, what amazed me was the color you know when like 84s explode in the night and the, the greens and the yellows and it, it was amazing and then we were getting loads of machine gun fire and what it was the company was like in um can't even think of it now. We were like in extended line as we approached. And we'd all rushed into cover. And I had no, my, my platoon had no cover. There was like peat banks that the, that the local people dig for peat. And th the majority of C Company had got into P com into these peat banks. And the anti-tank platoon and support company, but we'd been attached to C Company. The anti-tank platoon, there was no peat banks. And we were just stuck out in the middle of nowhere trying to dig shell scrapes while we were lying with our hands trying to just claw the ground because the rounds were only just passing over our heads. If I would have went like that, my hand would have come off. That's, that's how low it was. It's passing just over us. And... Unbeknownst to me, I only found out when I was writing the book. Sergeant uh, Martin Baird, who was to our left, he was in cover, and he said to the to the CO of C Company, the anti tanks over there, they've got no cover. They're pinned down. Them lads, we'll have to get them lads out of here. Um, and then the, the machine gun fire started taking effect. You know, hitting people. Um, Corporal Hope, he, he was with A Company and he took one through the head. 
Um, he's still alive, but it, it was a fatal wound, if you know what I mean. Um, poor bloke took one. Then I, I took one. It caught me from the left. Um, it went through my nose, hit me cheekbone, took my eye out and my cheekbone out, and somehow my jaw smashed together and my top teeth out at the same time and threw me backwards. My helmet come off. Um, because <laughs> I never had it after that, like, you know. Um, and my mate shouted over to me. I must have, I must have made a noise. And he, he shouted, hey, you're all right. And I immediately when I got it, I put my hand to my face. And I thought, I've got a big hole in my face. And the, the foot, it sounds, it's not funny, but it was funny. When we were going south, we used to get drunk at, at the back of the, we used to drink in the, a bar called the Crow's Nest. And we'd sit on deck chairs at the back of the ship. ship. And I remember laughing one night. And we were saying, imagine losing your nose. You'd have to get a clown's nose on an elastic, you know, round your head. And I put my hand to my face when I got shot and I couldn't feel my nose because the round had passed through my nose. My nose has flattened. And I thought, fucking hell, my nose has come off. That's for taking the mic. That's payback because I'd laughed about it. I've, I've lost my nose. And, and then he, my mate, Jordy, he said, you're OK, you're OK. I said, I've been it. Um, he said, I'll come out because there was rounds going everywhere. And he said, I'll come over in a minute. And I said, all right. So he cl- and I, th- I think what Jordy thought, he's talking, so he must be all right. You know what I mean? He's talking f- lucidly. Um, so he said, I'll, I'll come over. So he crawls. He gets his, uh, another right angle torch things that he used to have with the little red lens. And he said, you're all right, Scouse. And I said, yeah, I'm all right. I said, but it's me head. I said, I've been hitting the head. And he he gets his little torch like that. And he goes, fucking hell. And I said, I've got two shell dressings in my top pocket. I said, get them on me face now. Get them on me face. So he did. He he got the shell dressings out. and But it was like chaotic, absolute chaos. Because we were pinned down. You couldn't move the the fire it it was if the grass was longer that it would be taking the grass off you know what i mean you know when you know i'm gonna die in a minute here and then the artillery started the mortar started because they were i say they couldn't shell the mountain yet because it hadn't been took yet all their old all their blokes are still on the mountain so they knew this bloke because what it was Lads from A Company started firing. A Company was just in front of us. They started firing. And in doing so, you're giving away your position. Do you know what I mean? They didn't know where you were till you start firing. And that's why lads uh, seeing seeing the NCOs and what have you were shouting, stop fucking firing. You know, you're just giving them somewhere to fire at. So they knew we were out there now. So now artillery's coming in, Everton's coming in. But fortunate for us, the ground was that sudden. You know, it's like a sponge, the ground. Artillery rounds were like landing all around us. But they were, be, they were just getting, they were just being absorbed and driving down into the mud and then striking something and blow, exploding but huge plumes of dirty black water. You were getting showered with it. We, if, if that ground would have been harder, we'd have all been dead. That, 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 because they shelled us all night. All night we were on there. And then, because I thought, eventually, they got me into a, a shell hole on the presumption that, you know, like an artillery uh, piece is, is sort of a scatter gun. It never puts rounds in the same hole because that's no good. You need to spread it about a bit. You know, it's no good firing on the, you know, there's got to be a, an adjustment um, to cover the area. And they thought if, if it's hit that hole, it, it won't hit it again. So we'll, and it was, it, 
a one five five makes makes a big hole, like you know, big smoking hole. So they put the wounded into this hole. I I was probably one of the first into the hole, so I goes in, and then uh, I mate another lad from support company got shot in the face uh, around. He was a an M controller. Um, and he had his head set on with his boom mic and the, uh, the round hit the boom mic and blew the boom mic into his face here, hit the roof of his mouth and then went went down his throat here, like, you know, and he was in a, you know, as you can imagine. And so Paddy comes in, Paddy Rail, Paddy comes in and uh, it, it, ra artillery rounds are dropping. It's It, it was chaotic. And then they, they managed to get um, Stevie and Stevie up. Stevie had been shot in the head. They got Stevie across, and with it being dark and chaotic, they rolled him in, and he was a big lad. He was a big, heavy lad. And he, he was 27, one of these old blokes. <laughs> one of these old blokes. And he rolled right on top of me. And in my sort of panic, I'm pushing him off. And they were going, don't, don't... I, I was sort of being a bit rough with him, and they were going, "Don't hit him! It's Stevie Hope! It's Stevie Hope!" And I, I said, I "Don't give him, give a fuck! Get the fat bastard off me!" So they, they got him off me, um, and then there was me, Stevie, and then they started more lads started coming in. Sid Fuller come in, Jock Breber. It started filling up this hole, and um, the rounds are still dropping, and you just thought this. We're gonna die here, you know. We're not getting out of this one, like you know. We're dead here. Um, so, to be honest, that was my part in the battle. Basically, uh, B Company battled through that mountain. They did all the fighting part of it. Our job on wing forward was once B Company had secured that mountain, A and C Company was going to take out another Argentine position to further east that we were level with. We t C Company did try to take it in daylight, but it was called off because it's like suicide. <laughs> you can't really advance. Wireless Ridge is still occupied on that side. They're all going to fire at you. The position we're going at has got 50 cals and 105s. It's, 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 the Brigadier said, don't even do it. The advance started and had to be called off because the rounds were landing the incoming rounds were landing all round C Company. So the Brigadier got on the blower and said, stop that advance because, you know, you might get there, but you just, you, you're going to lose loads of bloke, like, blokes. But from, like, basically my part there, so we'd all been stuck in that position and we were in, as I say, it's minus 15 now. It's freezing. The helicopters couldn't fly because it was that cold. The, the, Whatever makes the engines were frozen. We called for helicopters, but the helicopters weren't flying. They were frozen. So, and we were supposed to, we had four. With, we've been told we had four with night vision capability. And when the helicopters turned up, they didn't have night. They were, they'd been, the ones with the night vision had been tasked elsewhere. We just got four helicopters that couldn't fly at night during a night battle. Um, and say when we needed them, they, could, they, could, they couldn't defrost them. Um, so anyway, from our location, to get any medical assistance, he had to go one and a half kilometres to the regimental aid post, which was located on the northwest corner of Mount Longdon. And in between us and the regimental aid post was a minefield. And he said, right, get them into ponchos. And carry them through that minefield but don't don't worry the engineers have laid a white mine tape that you can follow but in the dark no one could find this white mine no one found it it was there somewhere but no one. so they had to go through the minefield carrying us on the stretcher while being shelled by artillery so we're getting sort of near the near the rap Play. We're in the same location where Brian lost his leg. We were in that sort of location when artillery ran. And Brian is still out there. Brian lay in that minefield from when he got his leg blew off 
till like seven o'clock in the morning. He was an afterthought. Someone said, has anyone, st- anyone treated him yet? Um, so Brian's still out there. So we come in, started getting shelled. All the lads who were carrying the stretches took cover, just dropped the stretches. They weren't stretches, they were ponchos. Dropped the ponchos. And I'll, I'll, I'll always be thankful for this lad. Um, a lad called Paul Ray. And he lay across me, you know, to shield me from further in- injury. I was on my own on the stretcher. Everyone took cover and Paul lay across me. And that's another reason for writing the book. None of these lads got at least, got an MIT or nothing, you know. And and like another lad, the lad who led all the, the stretcher bearers, you know, they should get, they, you know, they, you'd think they, they would have got an award, but no, nothing. Anyway, got into the, the to be honest, this, 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 the plastic stretcher bust, it broke, it split. So they ended up, Paul Ray and Steve McC- McConnell, grabbing me by the legs, under the arms, and they dragged me through the mud. He said, we dropped you a few, a few times. He said, but we managed to drag you to the RAP, got me in the RAP. And by that time, I'd, have, I'd had extensive blood loss. I'd, I was frozen to the core. And I was, Stevie was with, Stevie, the lad who'd been shot in the head, he was with me. And the do- doctor treated Stevie first and said, he's not a priority. Put him over there. He, he's non-survivable. They had a look at me. Non-survivable. Put him over there. So I got put over there with Stevie. So we lay there for, a, I don't know how long, because I went on, I just, I was unconscious. So next thing, next thing I remember is getting carried on a stretcher. And I'm on the stretcher going somewhere. At the time, I didn't know where, but I know now I was going to the mortuary area at the back, round the back of the rocks is where they were putting the dead people. Um, so I'm getting carried and I'm, I must have moved because this fella carrying the stretcher said, this one's just moved. And the other fella said, who is it? Who is it? And the other fella said, fucked if I know. He said, let's take him back. And he took me back. And I was no sooner back than he loaded me into this, a BV, you know, a snow cap vehicle. And he put me in the back of this vehicle. My head was just swathed in bandages. And there was like a load of other blokes in there. They're all listed in the book. Um, Lieutenant Bickerdyke, um, Bill Metcalf, the granddad, he was in there. Um, and I got in and my face was all swathed in bandages. And some fella, because you've got to take names. You've got it. Someone has to keep a log of who's in, who's out, who's missing, you know, who's dead, who's alive. Um, and he said, who have we got in here? And he said to me, he poked me and said, um, who are you? And I said, uh, O'Connell. And um, it turns out my mate was sitting next to me, Dominic Gray. And he said, Scouse, is that you? And I said, yeah, it's me. He said, don't worry. He said, I'll look after you. So, and he did. He looked after me. So we got took one half mile to a, a, a landing site just um east of the, uh, west of the Murrell Bridge. And um, as soon as we moved out of that RAP in that snowcat, they shelled us all the time because we were a legitimate target because the BVs were bringing ammo in and wounded out. Ammo in, wounded out. So they, although they had wounded people in, they were legit targets, like, you know. Um, so they took us to this landing site and laid us out there because... Now the wounded are starting to pile up, like, you know, um, and I went unconscious again. And I'm only going by by Dominic and what have you. He said, you were looking awful. He said, we thought we'd lost you again, like, you know. And he said, we managed to flag a gazelle down and gazelle flying past and they flagged this gazelle. And uh, they, they loaded me, Dominic. Dominic had also been shot and a bullet had gone through his helmet cut a crease across the top of his skull. Um, so Dominic, uh, me, Dominic, Paddy Rail, um, 
the three of us piled into the back of this little gazelle and um, I say, got to Teal Inlet, which was a medical reception centre, medical surgical, uh, advanced surgical centre it was. Um, so we got there and um, put you on the, the trolley and start cutting all your clothes off, you know, the way they run the scissors up and looking for second, secondary injuries. And I remember looking up at the ceiling and there was a big porno picture stuck on the ceiling. <laughs> and it said, if you can see this, you're still alive, you know. And I thought, you know, it's, it, it's something that, you know, it sticks with you, like, you know. Because another thing I remember, when they were cutting me clothes off, they were cutting me Norwegian shirt. And I thought, that's me good shit, me good shirt. And I had a pair of, I don't know, do, do, do you remember OGs, OG trousers? They were like really old issue. I think they had them in Malaya or somewhere, but they were really, they had double pockets on, on they were like classed as, I don't know what, if the Marines have a term. In Pararedge, we say, alley. You know, when something looks smart, that looks, that looks alley, that. They were alley, you know, they, you wore your eye leg boots with them and they, they were baggy and they looked the part, you know. And they cut me OGs off of me, Norwegian shirt. I thought, that's all me good. <laughs> because you know what I've done? Before we went on London, I thought, because I'd wore a windproof all the way through, you know, them windproofs. And to go on London, I got me smock out of me Bergen, because the Bergens had arrived by then. They, they chopped all the Bergens up to uh, Mount. Mount Vernon. I thought, when I get it, I didn't. I had no intentions of being wounded. You know the way you do. You think it'll happen to him. It won't happen to me. I thought, when I get into Stanley, I want them to know who's in. St you know, with your DZ flashing your wings, that green DZ flash. I thought, when I walk in Stanley, I'm gonna have me NI boots on, and I'm gonna have me OGs and me para smock. And uh, they all got <laughs> cut to bits, like, you know. But uh, such is life. And then I say, from there, um, what they done? Cut all my clothes off. And he said, uh, there's more aging people. There's more aging people than me. And I thought, I'm urgent. I've been shot in the head. Um, so they said, here's a blanket. Sit on that bench over there. Me, Paddy, Dominic. And we're sitting. I've got no clothes on by this blanket. And we're sitting there like that. And next thing, this, this Wessex turns up and we all get bundled in the back of this, this Wessex. And I remember seeing my mate, uh, Lee Fisher, and he was on the floor. He'd been uh, shrapnel in the back. And I just remember seeing Lee. And I went, because you know the noise and all that with the helicopter, you can't hear a thing. But I remember you could see his lips and he was going, all right, Scouts. And I went, all right, Lee. And uh, it took off and we were pulling out and I remember seeing the coast of the of the um you know, the Falklands going into the distance thinking that's it I'm out of here I'm out that you know that that's my job I'm I'm done now I'm off to the ship and then got on the ship and on on the Uganda the it had stairs and what have you but everything had been made into a ramp you know, for speed, so they could run straight down the road, that down the ramp with the stretchers and get you straight in to an assessment centre. And this doctor, um, I remember this doctor coming up and he said, um, right, what's happened? And I told him, I, I told him a mortar. I, I'm not sure why I told him a mortar, but I told him, a, I said, shrapnel a mortar. And um, he said, right, when did you last eat? And I said, um, I said two days ago, but it wasn't two days ago. It must have been about a day and a half, you know, something like that. It, I, I said two days, but I don't know why. Um, I said a day and a half. And he just said, get him in theatre now. And off I went to theatre. And, uh, and, and when I woke up, I was asleep for days. And I woke up and there was a nurse at the side of my bed. And she said, hello, sleepyhead. We've been waiting for you to wake up. And you know, I, I cried my eyes out, honest to God. I think it was, you know, it's, it's shock and everything, isn't it, you know? And she was just nice, you know, like, and it, it was a bit too nice and it just tripped tripped the thing, like, you know? And then I looked around the ward and it seemed like the entire, 
battalion had been wounded. Everyone seemed to be three para in the, in the room. Lads either side of me, Roy Bassey on that side, Graham Eaton on that side. Everyone was, I see Beat, Beatle Bailey, Ned Kelly, uh, Pete Craig. Everyone seemed to be three para on this ward. And uh, I thought everyone's been, <laughs> I thought the old battalion's been shot. But um, I say, we had taken a good few wounded, like, but um, just one of them things, isn't it, you know? Are you, Jimmy, are you kind of desperate at this point to get information about the battle and what's going on there? Um, well, no, no, to be honest. I didn't know who was dead. Who, who, I didn't, didn't know any. I found that out in England because... Mm. Um, me mate, honest to God, me good mate, um, Stuart Lang. Uh, Stuart had been killed. Um, Stuart had been killed. And I never seen him killed, but he'd been killed. And to be honest, because I, I never seen him being killed, I find it, at, at the time, I find, found it hard to actually believe. Although I had fellas who had wrapped his body up and took him away. It, it, it's hard to comprehend these things, like, you know. And for years, I thought, maybe they were wrong. Maybe it hadn't happened. Maybe I'll bump into him and say, where have you been, you know? But as we know, it was all correct, like, you know, and all, all the lads from the platoon who died have died, like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it it takes a lot. Um, it takes a lot to take in. Like me mate Denzel, is it like he's, he's, he's lost one leg, and basically the other leg is like a lollipop stick. The flesh has just been ripped away, you know. And such outgoing men reduced to you know disabled people, like you know, it's it like. Dave Kempster, you know, one minute he's a great fella having a laugh. Next thing he he's got an arm missing from the shoulder, or he's got a, fellas have got legs missing, and like, like we we made fun of it. We made the bet because we were all in sort of hospital together, and we'd laugh at each other and and make jokes about it, you know. Um, but that's like the way of coping, isn't it? You know, you you, you make fun of things like you know we could make fun of of them but you'd chin someone else who make made fun of it like you know but um yeah it's a strange thing isn't it you know gosh it's um just beyond comprehension isn't it really unless you've actually been through it i i can't even Truth, imagine truthfully, it truthfully i had times when i didn't believe it happened i didn't sometimes i think did i dream it did it happen but you look in the mirror and you go, well, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. You know, but I think a lot of us are the same. You just, sometimes you're not even sure. To, I don't know. You, like, because to be honest, it's so far away, yet it's like yesterday. Do you know what I mean? It's 39 years now, but I can get tricked like that. You know what I mean? I, I was went to Remembrance Sunday, um, well, must be two years ago now, because we had none last year. And there's with a fella, um, John Charlton, X3 para, and uh, we were talking about something, and it just come out in floods. It just come out. You know when you, I don't mean, I don't mean crying, I mean floods. It just fell out of me in buckets, and. It just, it only takes a word or a, a little something and it can just, it just takes you unawares. And like John was saying, are you all right? You're all right? I said, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all, I'm all right. You know, once you've got it out, but it it, took, it, it did take me surprise. I was in the pub, <laughs> you know, mad. Before we talk about your... I don't know if recovery is the right word, Jimmy, but shall we just mention uh, Stuart McLaughlin and 
Yes, you, yeah. And, he, and he, was it Ian Mackey or Mackay? Ian Mackay. Ian, Ian Mackay, Mackay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they were, there's some legendary tales oh, told oh, about these yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. What was going on there then? Well, Stuart McLaughlin was Stuart McLaughlin. Stuart McLaughlin is a man among men. You know, if if he walks in the room, you know Stuart McLaughlin's in the room. He wasn't tall. He was a shortish chap. Not short, but he wasn't tall. You know, you see big fat. He wasn't big, but he was an imposing character. You know, what he said went. And if he tells you to do something, you do it. You don't argue, you don't query it, you do it. And to be honest, Stuart was made for that night. When you need a leader to lead you in battle, Stuart is the man. And if he tells you to go forward, you will go forward. That He fought on the north side of the mountain. And let's say the platoon commander had been wounded. The platoon sergeant was dead. And the driving force was Stuart McLaughlin. Stuart was rallying people, telling, giving the ammo. He was the lead on the side of that mountain. In fact, to be honest, after, after the push along the northern side, when they were told to reorganise themselves and get a brew on, because A Company is now going to take over from B Company, he has to go with, with A Company and and advance with A Company. And the OCA Company said, no, we've, we've got enough blokes. You've done your bit, just have a, have a rest. And the, the CSM from A Company, I, I was talking to him for the book, and he said, I met up with Corporal McLaughlin. And Corporal McLaughlin said, if I can help in any way, just ask me. And got, uh, the company sergeant major said, well, what I do need is ammunition. So he said, Cop McLaughlin just went round the end. Anyone getting all the spare link grenades, 66s for a company. He was just, a, he was the man. He, he was just a man. Ask anyone. Mm -hmm. I know what you're driving at. Um, there was accusations. Is that what you mean? I'm going to be completely honest. I wasn't. I'm aware of them. I wasn't going to. Well, go I, I will. I will touch on them. There was accus accusations made about Stuart McLaughlin that were totally, totally without any foundation whatsoever. What it was, the people who made or person who made that them ac ac accusations never met Stuart McLaughlin, had no contact with Stuart McLaughlin, and he he also mentioned that the Padre was part of it. I've spoken and interviewed the Padre for the book. Totally untrue. Absolute. What it was, Pete, there was a list of medals made for the book. Now, the platoon commanders made their list of medals. I've got their... These are the, the lists that were made in Port Stanley. Port Stanley, they made lists. I've got a copy of John Shaw. He was the uh, platoon commander of 6th Platoon. Lieutenant uh, Mark Cox, who was the platoon commander of 5th Platoon, which is Corporal McLaughlin's plume, platoon. And he wrote of, of Corporal McLaughlin, outstanding with his leadership, put him in for a medal. And our medals, there was a, there was something went wrong with our medals. And there was, yeah, another lad from 6th Platoon, Harry Gannon. Harry Gannon was put in for the Queen's Gallantry Medal. You know the Queen's Gallantry Medal? Hmm. So if you don't get the, if you don't, you get put forward for it, you don't get it, what would normally happen? You'd get a lesser. You'd get something lesser. You'd walk, even if you walked away with a mention in dispatches, you got nothing. How'd you go? By being recognised by your platoon commander for a Queen's Gallantry Medal, and you get nothing. You must have done something to get put forward for it. And the same with Corporal McLaughlin. He was put forward for the Military Medal. I've got... I, I went up to Major... Major, Ar Major Argue is dead. 
I went to his brother's house because all his personal effects are in his brother's house, all in boxes. I, I got in touch with his brother, David, and I said, can I go up and have a look through and got all his notes and, and what have you. Got his field notebook and it says Corporal McLaughlin, military medal, so-and-so, military medal. All, all the medals in his notebook written by his commanding officer. So we've got his commanding officer, says he's fantastic. You've got his platoon commander, says he's fantastic. Here's a medal. Um, then I've got a letter of Major Argue, his commanding officer, writing to the CO saying, this man on Mount Longdon led his section like a demon round the rocks of Mount Longdon. You have read my citation. I've put in for an award. And the CO put him in for an award, but he never got it. And I can only think that it's jealousy that someone has said, you know the reason he got that, he never got that. And so he's he, completely untrue. I have interviewed the people who were there, every single member of Five Platoon. He didn't have the time to do anything. He was doing enough as it was. That was co it completely without any base whatsoever. Mm. You tell me or point me to anyone who actually, honest to God, the man's a brave man and he deserves the military medal. Jimmy, listen, I'll give you my word, mate. I wasn't going to mention it out of, yeah, no, to be out, honest. Out, out of respect and, and you yeah. know, mm. talking about the dead and all that. But now that we have mentioned it, are we going to say... Yeah, you, I, I'm quite happy because... To be Can honest, I tell you what? 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 It, it's just very funny that about twenty years ago, maybe even longer, I remember somebody saying to me while I was in the corps about that there was a para in some yeah, battle in the yeah. Falklands. I wouldn't wouldn't have been able to remember what. And he heard it off a fella who heard it off a fella who heard yeah, it off oh, a fella. Oh, oh, undoubtedly, it was the military, the old jungle drums yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever you call it, or Chinese mm. whispers. Yeah. Um, but it was you, just basically, you like, did, did you know there was a para in the Falklands who was up for the VC? No, no um, he wasn't up for the VC. They, I'm just telling you what what I mm. what the what the rumor was, Jimmy, and 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 after this this person, because remember it, might we not yeah, why yeah. not even be talking about the same person, yeah, right? Yeah. But but this person, what the the padre? Don't yeah. ask me how it was the padre found ears in his ammunition. What that that was it. supposed to be the Padre. The Padre, that, I won't say his name, mm. but part the, I know the Padre personally. When I was injured, he come and prayed at me bed. Um, I went down to his house. He made me very welcome. We we went through everything. He gave me all, all the help he could. And what a nicer, more gentle man you couldn't get because that's what Padres are really lovely men, and that was total lies. Mm. How did it come? How did it even come around? You'd always get some toe rag. You mm. always you get one man from three para to stand in front of me or stand in front of anyone, and I'll call him a liar to his face. Mm. Yes, I'm glad you covered. Glad you covered that. And to be honest, I'm I'm glad it's there. Because it really annoys me that that man went, went without his medal for some. And, and has cast aspersions on a good man who fought like a... He, he was everywhere. He was everywhere. Everyone knows. All those that were there knows he deserves that medal. That's why we do the march in London. We do an annual march down Whitehall. We've... we've presented petitions to 10 down the street. The CO has offered to rewrite the citation, but the awards committee have, have told us they don't do retrospective awards. The Americans do, the Australians do, but we don't. Well, those that know, know, don't they? And that's the well, most that's, important it, thing. The, the presence, um, I was talking to the presence at a past uh, CO of three para, and he said 
Corporal McLaughlin is a legend. Um, even now, amongst three para, everyone knows Corporal McLaughlin and what Corporal McLaughlin was. And can we just um, explain to our friends at home how, how he actually died? He was there, uh, he'd finished. The uh, A Company was now advancing. Uh, they were advancing to take full back the, the eastern end of the mountain. And it was the reorg phase. B Company are getting the brew on. It's it's over, sort of thing. For them, it's it's over. They're having a rest after a long, hard night. And further west, at, at further east, at the western end of Wireless Ridge, there was a 105. And from that 105 to Mount Longdon, Longdon is, I think it's 1,500 metres. Um, I have measured it. It is in the book. But I used to be in the anti-tank platoon. Do you know, do you know the Wombats? It's uh, like a recoilless rifle, like a... I, 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 it was a name from when I said, I it's, can't remember. Yeah, it's an old weapon. <laughs> it's an old weapon, but basically it's a tube on wheels and with a venture, with a, and a big bang comes out the back and you fire a 105 round out of it, like, you know. So, and it has a ranging gun at the top. It has a 50 calibre ranging gun and you fire it, you can fire a tracer round. And when the tracer round hits, you know you're on target sort of thing. You fire the ranging gun first and once you see the strike, your number two will shout, good strike, and you'll fire the main arm, armament, the armament then. So what this, this 105 was doing at the end of Wireless Ridge, he could see the machine guns. They knew that the mountain had fell, and our machine guns were fire. And I can you imagine, it doesn't get light in um, the Falklands till about 10 o'clock. In, it, we, we were working on Zulu time. We were working on London, not local time. We were working on London time, and we, it was called Zulu time. So they fired this 105 in, in like an hour. It, it, they fired it high, and it was dropping down, you know. They fired the first one. It went over fly off and impacted amongst the, the Milan crew, killed three of them. They fired another round. It, it fell short a bit and landed in the first bowl where Corporal McLaughlin was. Oh no, they fired, they fired a second. It killed a Royal Engineer, airborne, a nine squadron lad. Um, it killed him and it killed uh, Chris Lovett. Then they fired a third one and it landed in the same place. And it, a piece of shrap, it blew um, Grant Grinham's leg off. Um, well, it was hanging on, but come off. Um, and it hit Court McGlock in the back. It made a big, big hole in his shoulder here. And the thought at the time was it may have punctured his lung and what have you. And Corporal McLaughlin was saying, I'm, I'm dying, I'm dying. And he was saying, I, I, he can't afford to die. He's got a christening to go to because he had a young son and he wanted to go home for the christening. And um, the medic come forward and uh, Phil Probertson said, you're not going to die. It's bad. But, you know, it's a survivable wound. Um, so they started putting shell dressings on him and what have you. And he said, right, you've got to go down the at the regimental aid post, the RAP. He said, you've got to go down there. And he said, I don't want to go. I want to stay here, you know, with the lads. And he said, no, it, it is bad. You need to go down. And another medic stepped step forward, a patrol medic from, you know, like, uh, you know, like Pathfinder's patrol medic. We had D Company. That was like our patrols. And a, a lad called Pete Higgs said, Scouse, come with me. I'll take you down. So he's, he's walking Put, put his arm around Scouse and he's walking him down. And as they, they left the first bowl, walking down, and there's a ravine leading into the RAP. And they were just walking to the top of the ravine when a land uh, when a round landed to the rear of them and killed them outright. And one of the lads who one of the, the lads who one of, a kook and a royal engineer who found them said they didn't know what hit them. They still had their arms round each other. They didn't know what... They, they were here one minute and just gone the next, like, you know. It's terrible, to be honest. Sad that you've done so much 
and you're so near the med centre or the RAP, and he got it. One of them. Tragic. Tis, tis. And Sergeant so Ian Mackey, or Mackay. Ian Mackay, um, yeah, Ian Mackay, very, very brave man. Um, to be honest, we were very fortunate to get. Sounds mad to be honest, but um, we were very fortunate to get one of the men who shot him, um, uh, Gustav Gustavo Pedimenti. Um, Lieutenant Bickerdyke had been wounded, so he said to Sergeant Mackay, "You're in charge now." And Corporal Corporal Bailey had just been further east and spotted a fifty cal firing, and crawled back and said, we need, we need to take this out. So Sergeant Mackay says, right, we'll go forward and have a look at it and see what we're going to do. So they crawl about 150 yards forward along the northern side and there's a, there's a rocky feature and they crawl to the end of this rocky feature and the, the 50 cal is about 30 metres up on the high ground firing out to wing forward. So he thought, right, we'll take that out. So him and four, four men, but the fourth man, he said, it was a radio up and he said, you stay here, we'll go forward. You'll be the real link, like, you know. Um, so they moved for, and I, 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 I missed a bit. So they get to this rocky, rocky part and he, he sees the, the 50 cal firing and he says, he gets in touch on the radio and on wing forward where I am, there's some Milan, a Milan post out there. So he said, can you fire some Milan at this 50 cal? So Captain Mason crawls forward with his, with his Milan team, the team that would be killed later on, crawl forward and fire two Milan rounds. The first one impacted pretty close to the, 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 there was a platoon position. You know the way you have, there's the 50 cal, you had a platoon underneath as local defect, uh, local defence for the 50 cal. So it landed amongst them. If the rocks behind them, exploded. The other, one, the other Milan round went high. But the thought was it had killed all them fellas you know, who were in their trenches underneath. And he called Corporal McLaughlin forward to set a fire base amongst these rocks and said, Scout, keep, watch, keep an eye out for us. We're going, I'll, I'll let you know when we go forward. So he shouted up to Scout, we're moving out now. So they moved out. And as they're moving about out, suddenly all the Archies come to life again and start firing. Corporal Bailey's it, goes down. Um, Private McLaren, he dives into cover. Lance Corporal Roger James dives into cover. Corporal Mackay, Sergeant Mackay, goes missing. And then, this is the RG telling me, he said, the firing stopped. And out of nowhere, Sergeant Mackay is in front of their position, in front of their trench with a grenade, ready to lob it in his trench. And he said, we just all went, bang, 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 bang. And he, he said, this is what he said. He said, he, he, he appeared in front of us and almost stopped for a moment, as if surprised, and then went like that to, to lob the grenade in the trench. And he said, we all shot him, and he fell in front of us. And he said, his body was smoking. And he said, I reached out to take, he had a radio on, he had a Klansman, and he said, I reached out and his friend pulled him back and they, they sat in the, the, the trench wondering what's going to happen next, like, you know? And then four platoon, they sent another, because they had to report back and say, platoon commander's down, uh, Sunray Miner is missing, we don't know where he is, could be dead, could be anything, could have happened. Um, what do you want us to do? So they sent Sergeant Des Fuller to come down and take over the platoon. So he took over, 
and just said, right, we're just going to carry on pushing forward. So they, they moved, well, they said, right, fix bayonets. And they, they were in the cover of some rocks. Fix bayonets, we'll move out and we'll just a attack this RG position. And that's what they've done. And more casualties were taken and what have you. Um, but Gustavo, who was still in, he was in the position. He was shot. Um, all the lads are running around doing what they do, you know, grenades, bayonet, Everton. Um, and Gustavo said, I was lying on the, the bottom of the trench. And he said, I was shot while I was lying on the bottom of the trench. And he said, they're going he, th he said, I thought to myself, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. And he said, I was lying, being shot once. He said, and I remember them. He was shouting. And he, he, he wrote it as he could hear it. But I, I think he was shout. He was, he heard what John Lewis was shouting. John Lewis was there. And John Lewis was shouting, position clear, position clear. And he said it went quiet for a moment. And he said, I could smell smoke. He must have <laughs> lit up, you know, because for the nerves and what have you, you know. And he said, I could smell smoke and I could hear that. And he said, they lament lamented, that was his word, not mine. They l lamented for their fallen Ian Mackay. He said, they l lamented for their, for their commander. Um, and he, he, he went unconscious and he lay in that trench. And eventually, um, Fort Platoon pulled back and called another fire mission down on that position. Like, but that you've got to give the RGs the due. They held that position. They even with all that artillery bombardment, they just pop. what it is that mountain is just solid granite. And they, 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 if you get yourself in one of them nukes and crannies, nothing's going to get you out of it because, like, the walls are three foot thick. You know, it's going to take something to get you out of them. Um, that's why, to be honest, when three para took the mountain, they just occupied the Argentine positions because they were that good. They were brilliant. Um, but anyway, Corp McLaughlin comes forward again. He took, tried to take th that 50 cal out, but you just couldn't get near them. They, they had machine. They, you just couldn't get near them. Fired 66s at it, threw grenades at it. They could have held that position, but... The CO said, pull back, we're going to flatten it again. So they flatten that position again. Corporal McLaughlin pulls back again. I say, once again, he's evacuating the wounded. He's honest to God. The man was a star all night. How he walked up, well, he didn't walk away. But how he got nothing, I'll never know. Because every single man there knew Corporal McLaughlin is the man, you know? Jimmy, what was it like for the lads? I mean, every podcast I've done, every story I've ever heard, any documentary, this yeah, sort of yeah. thing, you know, no one actually talks about, this is fucking Syria. What, what, there's, there's torn up dead bodies everywhere. With it. I'm guessing their guts hanging out and their yeah, yeah. fucking heads missing and, you know, it, it's almost beyond comprehension that, that boys who are just, some of them teenagers, are having to witness this, be yeah. a part of it, and then, like, go back to normal life as though, you know, let's go down know, the pub it, and watch, watch freaking football. Well, that was the thing. It was funny. It wasn't funny, but it was strange that you flew back and you went immediately on leave, immediately from the steps of the plane on leave. And it, I, I believe, I don't know that much now, but I believe the modern fellas have sort of a decompression time or something like that, where they speak to someone or something like that. But it was different days then. They just said, off you go, lads. <laughs> <laughs> have a nice time we'll see you in six weeks because to be honest with me still being in hospital um because i was in hospital till no that um five months um i was in hospital for five months but i had surgery for five years um 
when with me being in hospital, I went to uh, I was in Roughton Hospital, uh, Cambridge Military Hospital, and the Woolwich Military Hospital. And when I went to the Woolwich Military Hospital, it was um, it had a, a a men, I don't know the with PC. I don't know the words these days, but it was like a mental ward, if you know what I mean. Mm. It it wasn't called them. It it was called something different then. It, you know the nut house by everyone, and it was full of uh, three para, two para Scots guards, Royal Marines. No, there wasn't. Not wasn't Royal Marines. I think you have got your own down down south somewhere. But that Woolwich was full of two para, three para, and jock guards. And they were all loony. I remember I, I was getting plastic surgery done upstairs, and a friend come up to see me. And um, I said, all right, I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm working me ticket. And I said, what, what do you mean you're working your ticket? He said, um, he's putting an act on, but he wasn't, you know. He, he was away with the fairies sort of thing. But he's all right now, you know, but um, it was sad days. And the thing is, in them days, you talk of 1982, I was 22. We never got a phone in our house till I was 26. So there's no, like, social media. There's no mobile phones. There's no one really to say, you know, to ring your mate up and say, because we never had a phone to ring. If I, our, our phone was a public call box at the bottom of the street. It was a different world. When me mum, when, when I was wounded, me mum found out very, very little. She used to go to the phone box at the bottom of the street with a big load of like five shillings and, and two pences for the phone. And she'd be phoning the, the Ministry of Defence saying, what's happened to our Jimmy, you know? But they, they, you know what they say, we don't know, you know, we can't tell you nothing. How did that you? Days. How did you get home? Um, I. Well, it was a funny one. Um, I went from the from the Uganda. Um, we went on. The, when you got better, they put you onto the uh, HMS Hydra, and from Hydra, you got taken to um, Uruguay, Montevideo in Uruguay. So we we got there, and as soon as you get off the boat, the boat sails to pick up more wounded. It's doing a constant, you know, shuttle service, like, you know. And uh, so we got off the boat. The boat sails. And they loaded us into ambulances, coaches, because they didn't really want us long in the city. Uh, they just agreed to get us on the planes and out. They didn't want, they just didn't like us there, but they just, but they obliged us. And uh, so they took us to Montevideo, international airport mm. so i was thinking of something like manchester airport or you know like a modern day airport so we go to this airport and it was like a shanty like a, there was like mexicans with shotguns surrounding this like dc-10 that had flown in raf thing that had flown in and um we get on this plane and uh, it starts running down the, the runway and there's a load of us all ill people like you know and it sucked a load of chickens up off the runway and blew the engine up the end the plane come to a screeching halt on the runway they had to get us all back off the plane and they had to put us up in a gymnasium in montevideo while they flew another vc10 back from the ascension islands to pick us up you couldn't fit you couldn't imagine all chickens on the runway and it sucked them up because, you know, the, the fellas guarding the plane were like Mexican bandits. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I've travelled a lot in that area. Uruguay was where the rugby team came from that crashed in the Andes and they ended up having to eat the dead bodies. Well, when we were in the gymnasium, we're all like, all eight. Well, and I tell you who was on the same flight as me, Simon Weston. So you've got all Baines fellas. You've got fellas missing legs and all that. And while we were put up overnight, there's loads of fellas coming in. Do you want to buy a leather jacket? Because Montevideo is famous for leather. And none of us have got a penny to our name. <laughs> we said, fuck off. You know what I mean? 
leather jacket. Who wants a leather jacket? I just want to go home. What was it like to reunite with your family? Well, to be honest, we were flying in. And uh, it's a long flight, as you know, you know, from Uruguay to Ascension to Bryce Norton. And there was talk. I don't know where the talk come from, but someone said family are meeting people at Bryce Norton. And this lad, lad from Tupac, who was sitting next to me, he'd been shot up. And he said, do you think your family will be here? And I said, don't think so. I said, they live in Liverpool. We haven't got a car or anything like that. So I can't see my mum and dad coming down here. And um, got off the plane. And then we were taken to um, RAF Roughton in Swindon or outside Swindon. And I was up on the ward and say everyone's, we're all in the same boat. Everyone's been hurt. And next thing, out of the blue, my dad appeared at the end of the at the end of the world, and he come flying up that that um, and my dad's as hard as nails. My dad would kill you with his luck, you know. And he come up that that ward, and he cried his eyes out. He grabbed me and he he sobbed his heart out. And you know, that's me dad and me dad. That's not me dad, you know. Me dad's tough as our boots, like you know. But it, it's what I'd put him through, like you know. You don't realise what you put your families through, you know. So, Jimmy, in in hindsight, and I know this is a bit of an academic argument, it things, yeah. but should so many young men have been put through what they were put through? Should there have been a different, a diplomatic? Um, we tried diplomatic; it didn't work. Once they, once they, we never started it. And in many ways, it was the best thing that ever happened to them because they were being ruled by a military junta. Death squads were going about. There was 30,000 people disappeared. You've heard of the disappeared in Argentina. Yeah, uh, well, we've had that, the same, there was the same thing in Northern Ireland, wasn't there? The well, disappeared. The, it was in Chile and Uruguay and all them places. They were run by military dictatorships. And since the Falklands War, they've lived with freedom. You know, that argue, I, to be honest, I correspond regularly with, you know, that third bowl that I was just talking about where Sergeant Mackay was trying to take that 50 cal out. I correspond with the man who was in charge of that 50 cal. We correspond on a regular basis because he's a he's a really nice... Domingo Lamas is a really nice man. When I was ill, because I've had cancer, I've, I've lost a kidney, then I lost both kidneys, I ended up on dialysis, and he would he would send me messages saying, my family are saying prayers for you, and, and, and Everton, the man is a lovely Catholic man, and they're a very Catholic country, to be honest. And um, the, Domingo was very helpful with writing the book. He took part in the, in, the, in the writing of the book. Carlos Coleman, he took part in the writing of book, the book. His platoon commander, Sergio Dachari, he took part in the, in the writing of the book. Now, Sergio, he lost his brother on the Falkland Islands. And you think he would have been a bit reluctant to take part, but that man was very helpful, you know, with maps of his machine gun positions and, you know, just showing us where was where, you know, because it, it just helps with the accuracy if you're getting it from their side. They were on there for a month, so they know where their positions were, you know. We were on there for a matter of three days, so you know, it's hard to remember. You, you come on there in the dark, and then you hid in the shallow while you were getting shelled. So you didn't really get a proper look at the place, like you know. Jimmy, what date? What date did the battle end? The battle. We left it. It. We advanced towards Mount Longdon on the eleventh of June. We the the actual start of the battle was on the twelfth of June when Brian initiated. Well, he didn't initiate, he stood on a mine, but that initiated the battle. He stood on the mine at just gone one o'clock in the morning, which was the 12th. So it all kicked off from the 12th and it finished at half 10 on the Saturday morning. 
it, we walked up to it on the Friday night, passed, got across midnight, and then one o'clock in the morning, it kicked off, and by half ten in the morning, it had finished. And then we just held on to Longdon while it was shelled to pieces. Would that have been the 15th that ended? Ended on the 14th. 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 We, we, we advanced on the Saturday. We fought it on the, the Saturday, it, the Friday night, Saturday morning. And then we occupied it Saturday and Sunday. Sunday was the 13th. Mm -hmm. And then on the 14th, it was the Monday. And it folded on the Monday. So yesterday, it would have been the anniversary is what I'm getting at. And the anniversary of my kidney. Uh, my kidney was the four. I got my kidney on the 14th of June. Mm -hmm. how, how, how come you lost your kidneys? Was, was this a drink related thing or? No, it was cancer. Um, I got cancer in my kidney, in my left kidney. So they removed my left kidney. And once they removed it, the right kidney went, what have you done? <laughs> and that died. So left me with no kidneys. So I, I was put on dialysis for um, four and a half years, which is, I don't know, you know, every other day you get your blood washed out. You're going for eight hours a day, getting your blood washed out for four and a half years. And while you're on it, people are just dying around you. You know, people die regularly on dialysis. You, you come in and you say, where's Ted? Where's Barbara? Oh, he died at the weekend. Oh, where's Julie? Oh, Julie's dead. It's I, I, You're just waiting to die yourself. But um, I was very fortunate, and a kidney became available. It became available, would you believe it, on the 12th of June, the anniversary of the battle. On the 12th of June, I got to the hospital, and they said, it, it sounds awful, this. He's not dead yet. We're just waiting for him to die. So he said, sit on that ward. So I sat on the ward, nil by mouth, for two days. I could just have water and tiny little bits of, of like, custard. You know, soft stuff that you can just get rid of. And I sat there, and he died on the 14th at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he just whizzed me straight in and took his kidney sort of thing. Terrible. He died, young lad died in a mo motorcycle accident. Gosh. And how about, how about your mental health then, Jimmy? How did, did you suffer? I think, I think everyone suffers. There's not a person who goes through conflict that doesn't suffer. You know, where to agree, it's just the extent. Um, but I don't believe anyone who's been, it's whether any traumatic situation, it lives with you. It'll be there. It's burnt on your soul, you know? Like, to be honest, when I first come back, I said, and with a lot of lads, it was drink. That was your medication. Everyone drank. And I don't mean socially drink. You drank to get drunk. In fact, beyond drunk. And everyone done it. It was, it was the done thing because it was a way of coping. Because who'd you talk to? You, like, I had no phone. I had no mobile phone. Um, there's no computer. There was no, none of these, what is it? Um, it's good to talk. There's not, in 1982, there was none of that. There was nothing. There, what, there was nothing. The only ones you could talk to, and with, with our regiment being one of them regiments that are made up with people from Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales. I lived in Liverpool. <laughs> do you know, who do I talk to? Do you know? The only what I tell you who were a great help to me, me mum and dad, when I'd come in drunk of a night, I could babble on to me mum and me dad, and they'd let me talk through the night. And they did it all before, but they still listened and listened again because I was their son and, they, and they'd done everything they could for me. As they say, it's good to talk. It is definitely good to talk. And never bottle it up if, even if it's your mum and dad tell your mum and dad you know if you can't find a mate like me stuck in Liverpool talk to your mum talk to your dad talk to anyone it it because it, it'll burst if, if it doesn't come out it'll burst yes we need to protect 
our mental health. In it's uh, honest to God. I, I'm glad that today there is so many messages out there and so many pointers to places where you can go and speak to someone. Tell them how you feel. You know, if 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 you wanna scream and shout, go and go and scream. Even if it's your your mate or anyone. Go to, there is places out there that wasn't for me and my mates. Mm. And I'll, I'll tell you this, and I won't name names. There were people who went off the rails. There were people who took their own lives. There, there's, there's lots of lads kill themselves in the most extreme ways. Ways that if they, had a, if, if they hadn't lost their mind, they would never have done that. Like, you know, fellas who've done things that they would never have done had they, if their balance of the mind hadn't been turned. You've, honest to God, anyone I'd advise to talk, talk yes. to anyone. Reach Seek out, them. folks, reach yeah, out. Yeah. Jimmy, I'm, I'm just, I wish you so much luck with your book. Three days in June. It's already been released, hasn't it? it it's got, yeah, it's been released. And to be honest, uh, Chris, it's done me good talking to you, to be honest. Honest to God, I've, I really appreciate it. To be honest, I've never talked at length to, to, to anyone. I, you know, me, they've had me on these little, little, little interviews and it's been 10 minutes. And you can't do nothing in 10. You can't say nothing in 10 minutes. It's nice to talk to a fellow veteran and that's it, you know. You know it's good. It's good to talk. Yeah, we've been lucky on this podcast, mate, to host some incredible people and, and their stories and and their stories that would get lost lost to time if we didn't record them. And truthfully, that was the same thing with my my book. I was sitting on a, ta a taxi rank because I'll tell you a stupid little story. When I left the army, I found it re Liverpool was going through a terrible time of un unemployment and what have you. And I thought, mistakenly, that I might be a bit of a hero. You know, I've lost my eye in the four ones. I might get a job easy, like, you know. And I couldn't get a job anyway, you know, because they didn't have the Disil Disil Disability Discrimination Act didn't exist then. So I applied for that many jobs and got knocked back because you've only got one eye, mate. Uh, you know, if anything happens to the other one, you know, we don't want to employ you, like, you know. And... The only job I'm, I'm glad I never got, there was a job in the paper for a traffic warden and I applied to be a traffic warden and they said, oh no, you've, you've got to have two eyes to be a traffic warden. And I said, you're putting tickets on parked cars, mate. You know, I'm not going to miss them. And it, I, I applied to be a postman because my uncle was a postman. He said, try the post office. He said, you'll get in there and it's a job for life. And I said, all right. And he said, You've got to have two eyes to be a postman. I said, you're putting letters through letterbox, mate. And then a mate said, what about the taxis? Have you tried the taxis? I said, I've only got one eye. How am I going to get a job on the taxis? He said, my mate's got a job on the taxis and he's only got one eye. And I got a job on the taxis for 23 years driving a black cab in Liverpool with one eye. And you think, even I used to think, because I used to employ Fellas in the end, and um, I thought I wouldn't employ a fellow with one eye <laughs> driving a cab, you know, because you think, because one of the drivers used to say, God, it's hard driving a, a cab with one eye. I said, How do you know? He said, I tried it the other night, closed one eye. I said, Don't be doing it in my cab, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a buddy buddy system. You both, if, if both of you got one eye, you can. <laughs> Join in a partnership and become a cab driver. Yeah. But it kept the roof over my head, you know, and that's what it was. I was sitting on the rank at Lord Nelson Street and I thought, all these memories are going to be lost if someone doesn't do something. And I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to write a book. I've never wrote a book in my life. Left school with nothing. And I went to WH Smith's and I bought a book titled How to Write a Book. <laughs> and that book got got me through writing a book things you do when you're daft 
Mate, if you'd have told me back in the mob that I would have written six books now, or is it seven? I'm not sure. And I've also written a book, How to Write a Book, or How to Write a Memoir. Did you, did um, you, leave, did you leave school with anything? No, mate. I was, I was, yeah, I, I had two O levels, but I took, I think, nine. So yeah. One in control technology because I like playing with stuff. Yeah. You know, playing with gadgets, and the other was in design tech. I had a CSE in woodwork, <laughs> woodwork, and uh, an art, <laughs> and that was my total qualifications. Mm. I did three O levels, or I think they were GCSEs by then in in the Marines itself. Yeah. Uh, my mate just went, "Oi, they do them for free." Get mm. yourself so I applied for free and I passed them. I mean, it's a lot of things. I found things a lot easier when I was an adult. But the best advice I was ever given with respect to writing, and this is what changed my life, even though I didn't know at the time, was is that uh, my mate said, get yourself on a GCSE English language course. Mm. So I applied for it as a, one of those ones you sent you send off correspondence, yeah. and my mate said, right, what you do when they ask you to write about something, mm. you don't just put, you know, a bloke sat in prison. Mm. He said you instead you write the bars of light. Yeah, elaborate on it. Yeah, yeah beam through the, the the bars of the cell. Yeah. bounding around the room, filling yeah. the cell with light, yeah. filling the, the, the prisoner's heart with freedom, right? Yeah. I'm like, I've got it. It's just bullshit. He went, mm. yes, exactly. I did my first correspondence course, sent it off, got mm. a letter back with it, with the result, you know, with the marker and, the, and the, the marker said, Chris, your English is excellent. Don't wait a year to take the GCC take the one next month mm. and that was it and I um though you allowed a, a dictionary to take in with you mm. so I took the cover off the dictionary and I wrapped it around a thesaurus mm. and I took that into the exam instead don't I hope yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get arrested now am yeah, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um I use that same technique bullshit baffles brains and and then I realized that actually no that that is what writing is, isn't it? It's put, yeah. putting people in a picture. And But it, it, I always, I, I, I'd always advise anyone to have a go at it, you know, just to put something down, you know, because either that or it's lost. Yes, it, yeah. uh, exactly. And if you don't... And you, know start... what, you know what? These things you're doing is, is the same thing. It's lost. You know, if it's not, if you don't do these, like my book's my book. But this is me. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. And like other fellas you've done with, um, was it Nige? Um, Spud. Spud, yeah. yeah. Um, now you've got him. Now they, that's the actual man, like, you know. Hmm. They are good. Yeah, I'm very lucky. I like to, I like to kind of, there's a, we're not a military podcast. We're just a podcast because I'm military. Yeah, yeah. It's easier to get military guests because I just ask them and they go, "Yeah, all yeah. right, Chris." Yeah. But, but when you look at, at the other mi military type YouTube channels out there, they they just glorify war. That's all they do. Well, I, t you, you, I tell you what, you want to be a good one if you get hold of them. Um, Mike Von Batelli, he's on um, he's on Twitter, you know. He's a, he's a, um, he was the he was the doctor on Mount Longdon. Wow! Can we between us two authors are we able to spell his surname? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, well, Mike Von and Bertelli. It's B E R T E L E Bertelli. I did that, and I'm not even writing in crayons. Look, <laughs> no, but he's he's a re he's retired now. He was the head man in the British Army. He's done all the, the medics in Afghanistan. He rose to major general or something like, you know, he was a captain when he was on London. 
Um, but he's a he's the top bloke. I interviewed him. I went down to Sanders. He was teaching at Sanders, and he I said, "Can I interview you?" And he was no problem. Yeah. If if you ask him, just say you've just done Jimmy O'Connell, the fellow who wrote Three Days in June, and he knows who I well he knows who I am, like you know. Thank you, Jimmy. I'll I'll I'll, I'll send you his Twitter name or whatever you call it, username, um, so you can just get on to him, like you know. Brilliant. Right, Jimmy, I'm going to bring this to a close because I don't want to go on yeah, too no long problem. because people won't watch it. They won't have time. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I want, every, I want everybody to watch watch this podcast. Yeah. Mate, I'm... I'm really honoured that you've told us... Honest to God, mate, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I made up you give me the opportunity. Yeah, it's... We have both ways, mate. I never thought when I was back at 12 years old watching the ships come into Southampton and um, that I'd have the honour of talking to you guys all these years later. It's just incredible. Um, but Bombatelli, you, for, Bombatelli would be a good one for you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, Because he's, he's done the Falklands, so he's seen the advancing medicine through to Af Afghanistan. He's done... Iraq, Afghanistan, the Falklands. His career encompasses all that. Let's get let's let's send him a message, Jimmy. Why don't you come back and we'll do a live YouTube show together, and then our our subscribers can ask you. You know, I'm sure they'll have loads of questions for you. See how um, this one goes first. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is this this will go well, mate. You, uh, but I, I I will think about it I'll definitely because yeah. to be honest. It's been good. You're all right. So yeah. that, that's after battle. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so right, Jimmy, let, Jimmy let just get a brew on. Yeah, right. just stay on the line, mate, so I can uh, thank you after I hit the record button. Yeah, go on. But, but legend, mate, thank you ever so much. All right. Um, to all our friends at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, that really just helps to tell these stories that otherwise would be lost to history and and you know, we're talking some brave men gave their lives for for us certainly for the people in the Falklands and um let, let's keep these stories recorded that's it see you next time